Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to the webinar of uh, India Ratings. Our speaker for today is Deep Mukherjee, the Director of India Ratings uh, Corporates. Uh, the topic for today is a decade high of uh, leverage levels and what really is going to be the implication for disinflation which we are seeing uh, play out, which could be a new theme going forward. Uh, handing over now to Deep Mukherjee. If you have any questions, kindly type into the question section on your webinar itself. Thanks, Dan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Deep Mukherjee, and I am joined by my colleague uh, Purti Shenvi, uh, who has worked on the analysis. Uh, so, we have repeatedly, uh, uh, for the last three, four years, have been tracking the leverage conditions of uh, Indian corporates. Uh, we were one of the earliest research houses to do detailed analysis on uh, entire set of 500 largest corporates and has been tracking them. Uh, last year in FI14, uh, when we did the same study and the current uh, webinar is an update on that study, we, we had uh, expected the leverage and some of the credit metrics to bottom out. However, we were not sure on the recovery. And uh, looks like we were right. Uh, the credit metrics has been bottoming out on an aggregate basis, uh, though it is difficult to say whether we have hit the bottom or not. But as we have expected last year, it, it is somewhat early to say whether we see any meaningful signs of recovery whatsoever. Uh, so first on the scope of stu study, it's the same 500 listed corporates excluding banking and financial services with the highest balance sheet debt as of FY14. Uh, if we take the FY15 numbers, at possible there will be maybe a swapping swap out of 10 companies and that too at the lower end, so hardly the study would change. This corporates, as of today, accounts for 31.99 uh, trillion of total debt. Uh, so obviously, though not the entire debt would be a bank loan debt, it would be a combination of uh, capital market instruments as well as ECBs. But, but it's, it's fair to assume that the actual banking exposure for this 500 corporates would be to the tune of 18 to 20 trillion Indian rupees. So, so that's a that's a substantial amount, and a trend or any trend that comes from this uh, may be uh, may have its implication on the banking sector portfolio as well as its NPAs. 69% uh, of the debt attributes to five mega sectors, which is quite well known: power, metals and mining, oil and gas infant construction and telecom. Uh, certain disturbing things that we see, of course, are that uh, of this 500 corporates, 73 are yet to publish their annual report or audited balance sheets. Uh, obviously, most of them have, almost all of them have published their provisional numbers, so which help us calculate, uh, more, uh, say, something like a median coverage uh, with quite a bit of precision. but. Uh, say, for instance, for leverage numbers, we had to project their debt levels based on public information as well as past trends. Now, these 73 corporates per se were not great corporates to start with in terms of leverage. In, as of FI14, when we had the last full year data for these 73 corporates who has not published their annual report in FI15, these 73 corporates had a leverage of 92 and a coverage ratio of 0.6. Uh, it looks like that these companies hasn't deteriorated a lot since then. I mean, with 9.2 leverage, it is difficult to envisage further deterioration anyway. But uh, so, so there, there are these uh, these caveats. Obviously, for their coverage and all, we have the provisional numbers, and there shouldn't be any issue. So moving on to the first search uh, slide. Uh, Whereas we generally discuss a lot on the real GDP numbers, uh, the discussion on nominal GDP numbers is somewhat limited. 
and if we track the nominal GDP number, the FY15 nominal GDP was 10.5. And if you look at Q1 FY16, the nominal GDP was uh, quite low, 8.8. .8. Uh, implicit GDP deflator is also at a historic low. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, sort of out of place to say that nominal GDP numbers like 10.5, 8.8 uh, are among the lowest that we have seen in a decade. Why are we discussing nominal GDP? Well, we, we are currently in a disinflationary scenario where inflation is obviously going down and this is the transition stage. And there's no argument that, uh, you know, high inflation needs to come down. But uh, when, the pro when any economy moves from a high inflation trajectory to a low inflation trajectory, there's a, a negative impact in productivity or, a, you know, negative impact in systemic productivity, which is calculated in the form of sacrifice ratio. Now, RBI has calculated the sacrifice ratio for India and it's broadly in the range of 2%, which is to imply that for every percentage point our inflation is shaved off, uh, the productivity would in during the transition phase be shaved off by 2%. Uh, now, uh, a reflection of that we see in corporate balance sheet. Now, here I would like to highlight that revenue and profits, EBITDA, PAT, PBT, they are nominal, that they are not adjusted for inflation and we can see that by the fact that uh, the revenue growth in FY15 for the 500 largest corporate bo listed borrowers there, and of them roughly 380 of them would actually be part of BSE 500 the revenue growth is just 0.78 percent which is actually the lowest revenue growth since FY9. FY9 was a year of lemon crisis. Uh, EBITDA growth is sort of trending down, uh, though we have seen lower EBITDA, absolute EBITDA growth, but uh, this year FY15 and what we may see in Q1 FY16 and or for that matter H1 FY16, uh, we would continue to feel aggregate pressure in uh, revenue and EBITDA and uh, uh, this would delay the, uh, this would delay the recovery of credit profiles. The reason being that the debt in the balance sheet would remain what it is, but the EBITDA that would be used for servicing this debt would, would not grow in a hurry. So this is a more recent development over last 12 odd months, and uh, this is a significant roadblock to a quick recovery of India's credit profiles. If we, if we look at the next slide on aggregate credit profile, uh, we find that uh, the debt growth has been quite slow. It's, it's the aggregate debt growth for these 500 corporates has, has been just 3.7 percent. Part of it would get reflected in the low banking system uh, uh, loan book growth, particularly industrial loans. So there are two reasons. One is possibly some form of uh, risk aversion by the lenders. B, a lot of, uh, lot of corporates are themselves, we find very, very cautious in, with their debt plans. Some are actually uh, trying to deleverage either by selling assets or uh, reducing their working capital. So. We see that uh, there's a check on debt growth and we do not expect uh, debt to grow in a hurry. Uh, we would see low, uh, low single digit debt growth in uh, you know, at least FY16 and better part of FY17. But the uh, problem remains of course is interest expense growth which has gone up uh, by 11.8 percent. It's still lower than the growth we have seen in FY14 but if, if your revenue is growing by less than a percent, if your absolute EBITDA is growing by 6%, uh, interest expense uh, shooting up by 11.8% on a relative basis, ability to service interest rates uh, gets affected uh, and we will see that in the subsequent slides. Uh, however, one bright point out of this whole discussion is that even though the EBITDA is, 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 is short of moderating, 
we see marginal improvement in uh, margins which are closer representation of cash and that would be funds from operations and cash flow from operations just uh, to refresh the discussion uh, funds from operations would be ebitda from ebitda you subtract tax expense uh, and interest expense you get funds from operations and from funds from operations if you remove the incremental working capital adjustments you would get cash flow from operations and we see that uh, on a relative basis FFO and CFO have have improved, which is to imply that the quality of earnings is better. And when we say quality of earnings is better, we mean that proportion of accruals in the earning is lower. So while the quantity of earnings remains stretched, uh, one good news is that the quality has possibly uh, improved. Uh, again, uh, taking a deeper dive into the margin trends. Uh, Again, uh, we see higher number of corporates actually tipping into negative EBITDA margin. So, uh, in FY15, 17% of these corporates, of these 500 largest corporates, had a negative EBITDA margin. Uh, this is actually an overall deterioration from a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, so, therefore, uh, you, you know, suggesting that. Yes, aggregated basis things may be bottoming out, but, but we may, you, you know, if the macroeconomic situation or if, the exter if there's an external shock, you, you know, whatever bottoming out or tentative bottoming out one may envisage or expect uh, that that may again go out of hand. Uh, cash flow from operations, uh, again, close to half of the corporates do not generate, their operations do not generate enough cash. Here I would uh, I would just like to sort of highlight that companies which are uh, CFO positive, cash flow from margins, uh, cash flow from operations, their margins are positive. We see that they have done a much better job of improving their CFO margins year on year. Whereas uh, companies who had CFO negatives, they haven't deteriorated all that much from previous years. The aggregated effect we'll see in subsequent slide is that. A uh, subsequent slide is that there's an uptick in CFO and FFO. Uh, again, this is another way of representing. Uh, if, if you look at the number of companies which are tipping into negative EBITDA and negative CFO margins, and that's a worrisome factor. Uh, you know, they, they are at an they are at an all-time high. Uh, so aggregated things may be bottoming out, but there are specific sectors, specific companies with which continue to fall and they continue to remain uh, a worrisome feature. And that, that's again, uh, you know, going back uh, to the title uh, of the presentation that the road to recovery, which is the credit profile recovery, would be a long one. It's not something one would see in a hurry. So th this is the overall margin trends. Um, again, uh, we see that EBITDA margin continues to fall, uh, but the rate of fall has been lowered. So uh, between FY13 to FY14, the margin has slipped from the median EBITDA margin has slipped from 12.9 to 11.4, a good 1.5 percentage point lower in FY15 we see that it, it's fallen by 0.6 percentage point. So given the fact that the rate of deterioration uh, is slower and we see marginal uptick in FFO and CFO margins, we believe that possibly we are closer to the bottom, but it's difficult to say whether we have reached the bottom or not. But one thing needs to be highlighted. The reason why the FFO and CFO margins in part of, part of uh, the reason is that a lot of corporates have pulled up their stocks and they have cut down their costs and improved their working capital cycles. But it is also true that a lot of highly leveraged co corporates met funding constraints, particularly on the debt front. So historically, for a lot of these corporates, their working capital was financed by debt. Now they were unable to get excess lines uh, to fund their further working capital. So to that extent, they were forced to short of uh, you know reduce their working capital or which ultimately affected uh, their ability to generate revenues and accounting profits such as EBITDA and PAT. Uh, 
this gets also reflected the, uh, in the working capital trends. Here we see that the net cash cycle for the median net cash cycle for the 500 largest corporates, uh, they are at 56 days. Uh, they have hovered between 56 days and 57 days in last three years, FY13 to FY15. So we would possibly think or tend to draw the conclusion as of today that the working capital cycle is stabilizing at historically higher ends. Uh, but one of the reasons, uh, but, but there are some disturbing uh, things that uh, are observable here also. Inventory days continue to remain elevated, which is reflective of poor or muted demand conditions in the economy. And if we have seen a modicum of reduction in payable days or receivable days, and particularly receivable days, it has a lot to do with the fact that commodity prices have come down. So that may be another factor which have uh, kept a check on working capital. So bro broadly, it, it's mixed. We, we, we do not see uh, further too much fall in working capital uh, in uh, EBITDA margins or CFO margins, but, but we, do we see uh, across the board revival in a hurry? Possibly not. Uh, are the number of companies which can give adverse margin shocks higher in FY15 than they were previously, yes, that number is at an all-time high. Uh, so so um, in the next slide we focus on, we, in the next few slides we focus on the median credit matrices uh, and uh, you know as the subtitle shows, uh, this is something that Indra India Ratings has published in September 2014, bottoming out more certain recovery proof awaited. I think it's almost uh, over a year now and uh, you know we continue to say the same thing uh, which would show uh, you, you know to an extent the recovery may have been uh, slower or uh, almost negligible to what almost all of us were uh, expecting and part of the problem is disinflation which is having a damping down effect on revenue and EBITDA and that's one word which is disinflation, we will hear more and more in coming period. Uh, for whatever it's worth, for the first time uh, since FY10, we see that the median leverage has fallen. So the median leverage is currently at 4.33, which is lower than 4.6 five which was the median leverage of FI fourteen. Which was the median leverage of FI fourteen, but if one looks at the coverage ratio, we would find that given the combination of weak earnings and higher in high interest expense or which is in part driven by high interest rate, the interest coverage ratio continues to fall way into well into Q1 FI16 and arguably we have on an aggregated basis the weakest coverage as of today that we have seen in well over a decade. So it's no longer the weakest coverage in a decade, it's we, have, we are possibly looking at the weakest coverage ratio in well over a decade. Uh, to summarize the extent of the problem on an average, a corporate spends two-thirds of its EBIT time just servicing the interest rate. So, so that cannot be a great thing. And uh, even, uh, and these corporates tend to have a median um, interest rate of around 12%, give or take 50 basis points, which means that if their interest cost is reduced in one go by a straight 100 basis points, even under that situation, uh, that two-third of the EBITDA going to service interest uh, would be, get to say possibly 60% of the EBITDA would uh, get to service, uh, would, would be used for servicing the interest expense. So unlikely to impact their, uh, so a rate cut or an interest rate cut by even a 100 basis point is unlikely to benefit a lot of them in a hurry. So so, so th that, that's, that's a problem. Uh, in next slide, uh, we, 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 we see how 
over the long term from FY4 to FY15, the leverage coverage matrices have moved and how the debt, uh, debt debts has moved. Uh, these are the median numbers. So uh, we have taken individually each of the corporates, say for instance in median growth of balance sheet, we have taken the year on year growth for each of the corporates and we have found the median of those growth rates. So they would be different obviously from the aggregate growth, growth rate of debt which we have previously quoted. Uh, similarly the leverage are also the median leverage for the corporates and the coverage ratio are of course the median ra ratios for the corporates. Going to the next slide, which is uh, here what we do, we take uh, obvi obviously if EBITDA is a accrual, uh, accrual based margin and not a lot of EBITDA is cash EBITDA. To that extent, a better way of calculating the coverage ratio is actually be FFO, funds from operations, though the ideal way would actually be to calculate coverage ratio by going all the way to CFO level. But uh, even if we take a look at the FFO based coverage buckets, we see that in the extreme uh, end, which is uh, in the lower end of the each, each of the respective bars, you would find that in FY15, 29% of the corporates do not generate enough funds from operations to service their interest, which is a relative improvement from FY14 levels, which was 35%. If you recall, India ratings in FY14 and FY13 highlighted that one in three corporates in India do not earn enough to service their interest rate. So it looks like there has been a marginal improvement. So it's not no longer one in three corporates. It's somewhat less than one in three, but it's just somewhat less, a marginal improvement, not a significant improvement. But what one should be cautious is that even though we see a reduction in the proportion of corporates in the extreme basket, we do not see any improvement in the proportion of corporates, say for instance in the so-called so better coverage baskets. Uh, of say a coverage ratio of 2 and above. In FY14, uh, we had 42% of the corporates with coverage ratios of 2 and above. In FY15, it's a marginal improvement of 43%. Uh, and if you, if you recall, the, these, are, uh, these numbers are way lower than uh, what it was ever since FY8. So the, this is more reflective of, of the stress in the system to the extent that the credit profiles of arguably better corporates or corporates which were not affected thus far may show some, some <coughs> at least as far as credit metrics goes, may show some sign of stress. In this next slide, we, we, we show we, uh, the distribution of corporate by coverage ratio, but this time we, we focus on proportion of debt. So here also we find that there's a there's some marginal improvement. In FY15, 24% of the debt belong to corporates who do not generate enough funds from operations. There is a marginal improvement over FY14 levels where there were 26 such percent. 26% of the debt belongs to, in FY14, 26% of the debt belongs to corporate whose, uh, whose earnings were not enough to uh, service their interest rate. Uh, this number has improved by 2% and in FY15 we find 24% of, corpor corpor of the debt rather belonging to corporate who do not earn enough to service their interest rate. But there is a note of caution. We would see that the number of corporates with leverage below 1.5 we would find that uh, you, you, you know more than 50% of the corporates of this 500 largest corporate actually have a coverage ratio of uh, below 1.5 and which is a year on year deterioration and it's possibly the weakest in an entire decade. And what does this mean? That you know, it means that you know overall the lending system may remain vulnerable to any corporate shock. So whereas on one hand we may not see any uh, sh short of uh, you, you know further increase in highly stressed numbers immediately, but given the 
the vulnerability of the system is overall basis is possibly weaker than at any time in the recent past decade which means that if there is any external shock a currency shock a demand shock a further disinflation or a further fall in demand uh, this whole thing can go out of hand very quickly and therefore we have highlighted any vulnerability of corporates may potentially trigger much higher defaults than may have been the case in the past so so yes we see aggregate numbers are showing less like leverage is sort of turning the corner but if you look at details the vulnerability of the system is quite high here in in detail leverage trend what 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 we are doing is we are trying to find out how the leverage has how the le leverage and, and uh, debt levels has moved so uh, effectively we had divided the corporates into four categories uh the bottom red is the level for corporates whose debt levels on an absolute basis have increased and their leverage level has however decreased i repeat the red in, in implies corporates whose debt level has increased but leverage has decreased which means that these are the type of corporates whose ebitda growth has been very very substantial on the other extreme the dark blue or the the top level is for corporates whose debt has increased and their leverage has increased so that's not so surprising but again a worrisome factor is possibly the light pink or light red chart where it says debt has decreased and still leverage have increased so there are corporates who try to reduce their leverage levels by by reducing the debt level but their ebitda has been so poor that overall their leverage has actually increased now here if we look at it in detail the absolute debt level of 60% of corporates increased in fy15 over fy14 within which 38% or just around 22% uh, of overall which is the red level in fy15 the corporates were able to improve their leverage because of improvement in ebitda uh, 48% of the corporates saw their leverage decreasing uh, one thing is that the corporates are much more aware of the leverage levels or their debt problems and they are currently acknowledging it and it does gets reflected in the strategy and growth plans as well and this cautiousness possibly is reflected in the fact that between fy12 to fy14 uh 57 to 64% of the corporates have their leverage deteriorated on a year on year basis but in fy15 we see a marginal improvement where only 52% of the corporates saw their leverage deteriorating uh so it's not that corporates are not trying the corporates are trying they were aware but uh you you know uh, again things like disinflation uh funding environment is possibly constraining uh, their ability to recover and that would possibly protract the recovery process than what we were initially expecting so so this is again uh, the next chart we, we just uh, show that these four categories uh, what has been the median debt growth and what has been the median margin growth so on the left hand side you find the corporates whose debt has increased but the leverage has decreased and we find that the they their ebitda has on a on a median basis shot up by 35% whereas uh, on the extreme right hand side you find corporates whose debt have increased by 19% but there there has been no improvement in ebitda if we go to the next slide and find which are the industries in which which each of this leverage trends uh, are are to be found we we find that uh companies belonging to uh, say sectors such as services real estate there we find that debt increase leverage increase is close to over 50% of the corporates interestingly you would find sectors such as fmcg which typically is considered to be a relatively defensive sector we find corporates 45% of the corporates in fmcg sector have their increase their debt and their leverage have increased but 
Here the point to be noted is that FMCG as a sector has lower leverage than some of the highly leveraged uh, sectors like infra construction, real estate. And a lot of these FMCG companies therefore increase their uh, debt possibly to chase higher returns of equity or otherwise, but, but this is a note of caution for future. If you look at corporate, if you look at sectors which have been trying to reduce the leverage, uh, you would find uh, the prominently featured car auto ancillaries and automobile and auto ancillaries. Uh, they, are, they have been able to, they have been more successful in reducing their leverage levels, but it has to be kept in mind that uh, for auto and auto ancillary in general, the leverage levels have always been lower than again the more highly leveraged sector. What may appear hurting is that infrastructure construction, uh, real estate, textile, we find there are at least one fourth of the corporates in this sectors are, have been successful in reducing their leverage. Now here let me highlight here the driving factors of reduction of leverage has been asset sales has been used to reduce the leverage and not so much as improvement of EBITDA, but uh, it, it's always good to note that uh, these over leveraged sectors have been reducing the leverage. Having said that, even uh, after reducing the leverage, uh, even uh, for companies, say for instance in infra and construction who have been successful in reducing the leverage, the median leverage level of that subsegment remains still quite high and there's a lot of scope for further reduction of leverage. So, uh, so, so that will be uh, it from our side and now we will be opening up for uh, questions. separate screen for questions. Hello, uh, if there's a question uh, from the audience who has been on, um, who have logged in through the telephone, they, they may please ask their questions. Hello? 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 Is there a question? Leaving conference. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. please this is Manju here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Manju. Okay, so I, I think I'm in the midst of all the people who are joining our leaving conference. Uh, I have one question, a very broad one. Uh, you know, uh, this is a very interesting topic you have dealt on. Um, uh, I was wondering whether, uh, considering digital inflation, What needs one of the things that needs to be done is first to resolve the NPS as early as possible. Uh, waiting for a bankruptcy code, even if it comes, it would take the actual implementation uh, would possibly take three to five years. 
so waiting for that period uh, where the uh, to resolve the npa would be uh, would not be helpful what is required is to solve the npa problem as early as possible uh, we have always uh, short of uh, advocated the policy of a, a centralized recovery agency or a sovereign distressed asset fund something that was done way back in sweden or spain uh, to solve their uh, corporate uh, high level of corporate nps uh, so th those things are required if the expectation is that the npa would resolve themselves when the economic growth comes down then you know we, we that that would be a long wait okay um, next we would would take question from pramit sen gupta has uh, a question do you think if interest rate goes down then this two third payment of ebitda to interest cover will come down for corporates yes promit uh, as i have highlighted in the example if 100 basis points of interest is shaved off from the interest expense of corporates then this 66% of roughly 66% of the ebitda is currently used to service uh, interest uh, uh, interest that would come down to 60% some relief but not a lot uh um, next we have a question from mr shankar raman ramachandran what are the sources of reduction in leverage other than asset sales that companies have ordered taken a uh, overwhelming majority of them has been asset sales uh, a few companies a very few companies have, have shown some ebitda benefit particularly when the some of them were where their projects came on stream and the least number of companies have actually reduced leverage by infusing equity there's next uh, question uh yeah vivek go ahead yes vivek go ahead yes vivek please go ahead vivek please go ahead any questions from uh, the con call uh, anyone who have logged into uh... hello hello yeah hi uh, i have a question regarding the working cycle issue yeah please go Yes, uh, historically, so for instance, prior to 2008, prior to 2008, this number was well below 50. It hovered between 44-48. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there are multiple reasons. A part of the reason has been aggressive growth growth aspirations of the companies. So they try to increase their revenue. and uh, short of ebitda and they went into aggressive contracts where they give lenient payment terms so what this caused is in better years they caused high growth of revenue and ebitda but their cash flow from operations shrunk now that they are stuck with those contracts or those practices where they have given lenient uh, short of credit terms in a bad economy they are unable to bring it to control so this working capital is unlikely to short of reduce in a hurry but we we are short of the best thing that can happen it is stabilizing at an upper end but i i would still highlight that a lot of the stabilization is also attributable to fall in commodity prices yeah yeah uh, eh, 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 do you have any other questions uh ratings
Hallo? Are there any more questions from the con call? All participants have been unmuted, leaving conference. Yeah. Okay, but that we close. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining in. Thanks a lot, Deep. Thank, thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks. Leaving conference. Leaving conference. Leaving conference. Leaving conference. Leaving conference. Leaving conference.